Well, when we first chose this theme for our sermon series, I wondered what in the world I might say. But even more importantly, Dave wondered what in the world I might say. (laughs) But it has been fun, interesting, and an inspiring study, as is often the case. The preaching topic for any given week sparks dinner table conversation, and this one included. And And isn't that the objective, really? to continue the conversations, to continue the stories each and every week. Well, growing up, I can't remember a sermon, ever, I don't think, that talked overtly about sex. Nor was Sunday school a source of information as far as sex goes, although there were some unspoken assumptions. As I recall, we didn't talk much about sex at all outside of pajama parties. And even then, we didn't really know what we were talking about. I think we talked in more obscure terms, like being a good girl or being a fast girl. For me, personally, I would just giggle. I think that was my personal favorite. And most likely, if the word came up, we would just whisper it, sex, if it came in our conversation. Most of us learned about the birds and bees at home, very briefly, kind of the facts of life talk, but I was kind of embarrassed, too embarrassed to ask questions. There was a book that I accidentally found on our parlor bookshelf. It was wrapped in brown paper, and it just begged to be read by a 12-year-old, a curious 12-year-old. I pored over every picture and word, and it helped me to connect some of the dots, but not completely. In ninth grade health class, the boys met in one room and the girls in another, and they showed the movie, The Birth of a Baby, for the very first time. It was like the premiere showing. Unfortunately, it didn't talk much about how the baby got there to begin with. And then I went to college. I was a phys ed major my freshman year, and part of the required curriculum was Human Anatomy 101. Cool. This was before the time of videos, before DVDs, and before MP4s. We got to see a slideshow, you remember those old slides, projected on a giant screen at the front of the classroom. And best of all, we each got to wear a pair of 3D glasses, which made the larger-than-life body parts come alive. You see what's coming here, don't you? Well, we saw all sorts of interesting anatomy magnified, eyeballs and tendons and hair follicles, and then there it was. Without any previous warning, the full Monty, male anatomy magnified. Now, coming from a family of all girls, I had never really seen such a sight before. And all I remember is that we were so glad to have those 3D glasses on so we didn't have to make eye contact with anybody else in the room. You know, we all have our stories about learning about human sexuality. Many of us boomers grew up in the church and we were taught that the gospel was one complete indestructible whole, particularly as it applied to human sexuality. And it was like we were being handed a kit or a how-to manual or an instruction book. But the gospel wasn't intended to do that or to be that. According to one of my seminary professors, Dr. Greg Carey, the Bible doesn't offer a clear or consistent sexual ethic. The sex lives of ancient people differed so greatly from our own that the Bible is rarely talking about the questions that we are actually asking as modern people. In short, we shouldn't twist the Bible into a set of rules for faithful sexual behavior, he writes. The relationship between the Bible and sexual wisdom is complicated. Some churches still teach that the Christian sexual ethic came to earth fully formed straight from heaven about 2,000 years ago. And throughout that time, there's been the assumption that there is generally one way for Christians to express their sexuality by practicing abstinence until getting married to a person of the opposite gender. However, consider that other than some heavy admonishments against lust and divorce, Jesus didn't have a whole lot to say about sexuality. In practice, he was notoriously soft on sexual misbehavior and even hung out with people who may have been less than virtuous. Jesus had nothing to say about homosexuality or sexual identity as we understand them today. He did have a lot to say about loving God and loving neighbor. 
Most of the instructions about sex came from early Christian leaders who started spreading the, the gospel or the good news. To be a truly devoted Christian during the earliest days of the church, one was supposed to stop having sex altogether. The belief that Jesus' second coming was eminent created an environment that exalted celibacy over marriage. After all, what was the point of getting tied up with worldly responsibilities when the end was very near? Christians could then concentrate wholly on things of the spirit. But while the second coming didn't happen, the emphasis on celibacy stayed. Couples in the second century were expected to stop having sex altogether after producing seven, several children. Did you know that for the first thousand years of Christianity, many Christians wouldn't have considered getting married in a church? Marriages in the West were originally just economic alliances made between two families. Both the church and the state stayed out of the proceedings. This meant that weddings didn't require a priest to officiate. Much later on, the church got involved in regulating marriage, and it wasn't until 1215 that the church formally put a claim on marriage. For much of the church's history, sex within a marriage was only tolerated because it did produce children, or it could. Indeed, Augustine, born in the fourth century, crystallized the early Christian understanding of sex. Influenced by Plato, Augustine ultimately helped shape even traditional American views of sexuality more than a millennium later. He promoted the idea that untamed sexual desire was a sign of rebellion against God and was a sin. It only became honorable when it was placed in the context of marriage and the possibility of children. There were countless others, theologians throughout the centuries, who promoted this understanding that having sex just for pleasure was a sin. The church developed some very specific requirements for what type of sex married couples could have. I won't go into all the details, but anything that didn't lend itself to procreation was discouraged. There were restrictions on what days of the week people could have sex, what time of the month. If all the rules weren't followed, it was thought that on the average, sex between married couples was only legal one time per week. Now, I'm not sure how this was regulated. My guess is that the confessional was a means of accountability fueled by guilt and shame on the part of those who violated the restrictions. Guilt and shame, that's pretty much what it was about. So what do we know today? Given our modern day knowledge and understanding of scriptural interpretation, what can inform and guide us? I'd like to read part of a paper that I rediscovered this week, and I wanna see if you can guess its source. It begins, the English word love has two antecedents in the Greek language, eros and agape. Eros is the love that grows out of one's own need to love and to be loved. It is the love that fulfills one's dreams and desires. It is the impulse toward life, union, creativity, and productivity. It is the self-actualizing drive affirmed in scripture. Sexual attraction is a dynamic of eros, but eros is more than the mere sensation of physical pleasure. A preoccupation with techniques in our society strips eros of its tenderness and its delight. The human body, its sensations, its beauty, its capability is not to be disparaged. The whole body is a marvelously designed gift from God. It is to be enjoyed and utilized but the body is not to be separated from the soul. Love making is most fulfilling when it is a comfort to the body and the soul. This blending of physical pleasure and spiritual intimacy is eros at its best. Do you think you know where, you, where we might have found that reading? A, a annual conference. This quote is found in the Church of the Brethren annual conference paper of 1983, Human Sexuality from a Christian Perspective. Isn't it beautiful as it refers to the blending of physical pleasure and spiritual intimacy? We are both sexual and spiritual beings. 
This p- paper is 7,500 words in length and quite comprehensive in its entirety. In a recent study of this paper, Brethren Pastor Mac- Matt Riddle is quick to point out that it's a 17-word amendment that has become the primary remembrance of this paper, used by those who deem homosexuality as not acceptable. Little nod is given to the other 7,483 words, which includes an entire section dedicated to dispelling myths and fears about homosexuality. There are several invitations to remind us to continue the dialogue, remain open to new ideas, and continue to keep up on the latest academic and scientific information available. We are both sexual and spiritual beings. There are two more facets to sexuality that we wanted to be sure to name before we leave this sermon series. First, as with anything as beautiful and God-given as human sexuality, there is a shadow side. Sex from the beginning of time has been used to abuse. Although we may not realize it, survivors are all around us. It might be you, and it might, might, might be me. Studies reflect that at least 25% of all women, that's one out of every four women, and 20% of all men, that's one out of five men, have experienced sexual abuse in childhood, and those statistics hold true in the church as well as society. 90% are abused by someone they know and trust in their family, in their community, or in their church. Because of this social stigma and misplaced shame, many never tell anyone, and if they do, we are often at a loss as to what to say and how to help. We, the church, must be ready for these conversations for the sake of both the children and the adults in our midst. I serve on an advisory board for Safe Communities. It's a local nonprofit that offers support to churches in preventing and talking about child sexual abuse. They have helped us to develop and implement our child protection policy. They also offer retreats and support groups for adult survivors of child sexual abuse, groups for both, both women and men. We must continue the conversations. Currently, on a rotating basis, our children use the Sunday school curriculum, Circles of Grace, that teaches more than factual information about abuse. In a loving Christian context, each child is assured that God loves them, that God is a comforter to those who suffer, that the church is God's community of people who care for others, and that each of us, male and female, is created in God's image. What a precious opportunity we have. We all need to hear that message of love, and we need to continue to find ways to provide safe space to talk. And that's the second point. If we say in this series that it's okay to talk about sex in church, then we need to talk about sex in church because we are both spiritual and sexual beings, and we need to intentionally make space to keep this conversation going. That's where the rubber meets the road. We can continue regularly offering the curriculum Circles of Grace for our children. We can engage speakers on different topics related to sexuality. We did a Zoom series with the safe communities at the beginning of the pandemic. Through the beauty beauty of technology, we can make that available at any time via YouTube. We can offer adult curriculum, thanks to the UCC Church for their product, Our Whole Lives. It's a study for classes and for small groups. The goals of the study are to connect faith with identity, relationships and sexuality issues in ways that lead to informed and healthy decisions and to empower persons to act responsibly as they seek to unite body and spirit, spirituality and sexuality, alienation and wholeness. We can offer professional support in terms of counseling and other resources for those struggling with issues of sexuality. We can offer support to those on the margin, to the LGBTQ community. Uh, We can take part in the Pride Week coming up October 24th. Check, Check our website for ways that you can be involved. We can continue to work for justice and equality for all. Several years ago, I happened to be at the courthouse in New York City applying for a license to officiate at a wedding later that day. The courthouse was packed. The lines were long, the energy high. 
and then I realized I had come to this courthouse on the very first day that same-sex marriages were legal and recognized. Most couples, as they left the courthouse, were weeping that justice had finally won and that they, too, could openly express their love and their commitment to one another. And I found myself weeping with them. To that point, they had been denied this very foundational right, something that I and so many of us had taken for granted. And I determined then to try to remember and to include those on the margins and to be inclusive, just as Jesus was inclusive of all. We pastors welcome your thoughts and your feedback. What are ways that together we can keep these conversations going? There is a book in the Bible, one that is used only once in the three-year lectionary preaching rotation. It's found about two-thirds of the way through the Old Testament and is comprised of eight love poems. According to our own Chris Booker, scholar and author of the Believer's Church Bible Commentary on the Book of Song of Songs, this book has much to say about human sexuality. It can be read, she says, at two levels. One is literal, as dialogues between lovers, a celebration of human sexual attraction, and a poetic description of sexual desire and intimacy. Or we can find a different level of meaning as we look through a lens to explore the love relationship between God and God's people, God and the church, and God and individuals. Overall, this collection of poems communicates a sense of the awesome power of love, Chris writes. Listen for the word of the Lord. The voice of my beloved, look, He comes, leaping upon the mountains, bounding over the hills. My beloved is like a gazelle or a young stag. Look, there he stands behind our wall, gazing in at the windows, looking through the lattice. My beloved speaks and says to me, Arise, my love, my fair one, and come away. For now the winter is past, the rain is over and gone. The flowers appear on the earth. The time of singing has come. And the voice of the turtle dove is heard in our land. The fig tree puts forth figs, and the vines are in blossom. They give forth fragrance. Arise, my love, my fair one, and come away. From Song of Songs, chapter 2. You know, we can talk about sex, baby. We are both spiritual and sexual beings created in the very image of God. And that is very, very good. 